In this video, I'm going to cover functional groups. So we've already talked about alkanes, carbon-carbon uh, single bonds, and alkenes, carbon-carbon double bonds, alkynes, carbon-carbon triple bonds, and uh, some aromatic hydrocarbons, those that have this kind of double, single, double, single, double, single pattern around in a circle. Uh, this specific one is called benzene. And so um, remember that a functional group is the idea that although there's potentially an infinite number, way, number of ways that we can arrange uh, atoms in an organic molecule to create a unique new molecule, um, we can generally group all of these potentially infinite number of molecules. We can group them into these categories based on uh, what specific atoms they have and in what specific order those atoms are in. And we call those patterns functional groups. So functional groups for hydrocarbons are those that we mentioned already. Um, but we, we sometimes have other atoms in there like nitrogen in amines and amides have a nitrogen atom. Um, and oxygen is part of many different functional groups. You can see oxygen is uh, part of this alcohol group. Um, oxygen is part of this ether group. Oxygen is part of an aldehyde. It's um, on a ketone. Oxygen, two oxygen atoms and an ester. Two oxygen atoms and a carboxylic acid. One oxygen atom and an amide. So oxygen um, is an atom that is in lots of different organic molecules and you can see that depending on sometimes what are subtle differences like an OH bond or an OC bond those are different functional groups because they have different chemistry they're going to react differently um, or for example uh, this group here C double bond O this is called carbonyl if I have an H on one side we call that an aldehyde and if I have a carbonyl with a carbon on the other side we call that a ketone so sometimes these subtle differences uh, make uh, for big differences in the chemistry and the reactivity of those functional groups. So because they react in different ways, we put them in different groups and we give them different names. Um, alkyl halides, remember these are the halogen atoms uh, in the um, right next to the noble gases on the periodic table. So fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Um, and these we call alkyl halides. Uh, thiols are like alcohols with an OH except they have an SH. And again, there's lots of groups down here that contain this carbonyl functional group, car with, which is a carbon double bonded to an oxygen. And be they're different because of what's on either side, right? Because they all have this carbonyl functional group, carbon double bond O. They, they, have, they all have that in common. But this one has an H on this side. This one has a carbon on this side, a CH3. This one has uh, an oxygen and then a CH3. This one has an oxygen and then a hydrogen. And this one has a nitrogen. So these are all different functional groups because of these slight differences in the bonding pattern. Here are some other functional groups um, that we're not going to talk about. Uh, but there are more, a few more categories in which we can put organic molecules. Um, this nitrile group or an epoxide, just kind of this um, triangle shape, uh, disulfide, an imine as opposed to an amine, an I and an A, an acid chloride, an hydride, a nitro group, a sulfide. So there are other groups besides those that we're going to focus on, but we're going to focus on the, the main functional groups. So first we'll look at alcohols. And alcohols are um, any compound that contains a carbon. So R, this is the most generic version of an alcohol. R is some carbon containing group. And that carbon containing group is bonded to an OH. So if there's an OH on some carbon, then we call that an alcohol. Um, this mol the, here's a reaction of um, the uh, biofermentation of ethanol. So yeast can process glucose, which is a sugar, and create ethanol. And this is what happens inside of beer. And the ethanol is what gets you drunk. And here's some the carbon dioxide that's released. And this is what makes the uh, beer get become bubbly. 
so um, alcohol is this carbon group here, C2H5. It's some group that has carbon in it, and it also happens to have OH. So because it has an OH, we call it an alcohol. And this specific alcohol, the one that's in beer and in, in any alcoholic beverage, is called ethanol. So here there are more, of course, more alcohols than just ethanol. Here's ethane diol that has two OH groups. Um, here's 1,2,3-propane triol that has three OH groups. So anytime there's an OH group stuck to a, a carbon, we call that an alcohol. An ether is similar, um, except instead of having an H on one side, R-O-H, uh, it's R-O-R, so there's carbons on both sides of the oxygen atom in an ether. So here's an example of an ether. Here's the oxygen atom. It doesn't have an H on one side. It has a CH3 on one side, and it has a CH2 on the other. So when an oxygen atom is kind of stuck in the middle of a molecule like this, it's not on the end with an H stuck to it, it's kind of in the middle, then we call that an ether. So here is an example of two ethanol molecules, right? And they, they're alcohols because they have this OH group, OH, OH. Um, and you can see that the O in the molecule is kind of at the end of the molecule because after the H, nothing can be bonded to the H. So the O, H, and then it ends, right? Same on this way, O, H, and then it ends. When these two molecules react together, we can lose a molecule of water. There's two H's here. You can see this circled, this boxed in area has two H's and an O. That's equal to H2O. And so when these two molecules squeeze together, they condense, we say, and, and lose a molecule of water. Then we they attach to each other. This part attaches to this part, and we get this molecule diethyl ether. And so you can see that in an ether, the oxygen atom is kind of stuck in the middle of carbons. It's not hanging off of the end of a molecule like an, like an OH group, like an alcohol. An ether has an oxygen, but it's stuck in between carbons. Um, we, there are four types of biological macromolecules, and those are um, the four main molecules that make up living systems. One of those uh, biological macromolecules is called a carbohydrate. And carbohydrates are molecules like we see here. This is fructose, and here's a, a ball and stick version, and here's lactose, and here's a ball and stick version. And um, you can see that these molecules, these carbohydrates, have alcohols, OH, 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 OH. These are all alcohol groups here hanging off the end. And they also have an ether. Here's a carbon, an oxygen, and a carbon. So here's an oxygen kind of stuck in the middle of the molecule without an H on it. So this is an ether group. And all of these OHs around the end are alcohols. So a carbohydrate is made of ethers and alcohols. Uh, here's a, this one is called a monosaccharide because there's only one ring. This carbohydrate is called a disaccharide because there's two rings. And again, we can identify the alcohol functional groups, OH, 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 and the ether functional groups. Here's a carbon, oxygen, carbon. Here's an ether. Here's an ether in this ring, carbon, oxygen, carbon. And here's another ether that's joining these two rings together, carbon, oxygen, carbon. So there's three ethers in this disaccharide, and there's lots of alcohols, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight alcohols, three ethers. And this disaccharide is called lactose, and that's the same lactose that's in milk that gives some people some stomach problems. Okay, let's move on to a couple more um, functional groups that contain a carbonyl group. So remember, a carbonyl group is this C double bond O, and there's lots of functional groups that have this bonding pattern, but they are different functional groups because of what comes on the left and the right of the carbonyl. They all have the carbonyl in common, but they have different groups on the left and the right, so they're different functional groups. So we'll start with aldehydes and ketones. Um, an aldehyde has uh, a, car a carbonyl, and on one side of the carbonyl it has an H. So it might have two H's, 
sometimes aldehydes have two H's. Well, there's one instance in which an aldehyde has two H's, and that's called formaldehyde. That's the simplest, uh, the simplest aldehyde where there's two H's on each side. Um, but if there, there could be a carbon on one side, and as long as there's one H that's next to the carbonyl, then we call that an aldehyde. On this group, we have a carbon on the side. It can't be an H, because if this was an H, we'd actually call that an aldehyde, right? So we'd have a carbon on one side, and then a carbonyl, and then a carbon on the other. So if a carbonyl group is kind of in between carbon-containing groups, kind of in the middle, like an ether was, we call that a ketone. But if a carbonyl is kind of hanging on the end of a molecule, and what's stuck to it is an H, and there's nothing on the other side, because nothing can stick to H, then that's an aldehyde. So look down here, the aldehyde kind of comes at the end of the molecule, just like an alcohol does. Oops. Because when I'm bonded to, when there's an H at the end, nothing can be bonded to H, because H can only make one bond. So that must be the end of the molecule there, just like all of these are the end of the molecule on this side. Um, a ketone, on the other hand, you can see that it's kind of in the middle. The car there's a carbon group here, there's a carbon group here. This carbon group could be extended. There could be lots of carbon groups, and there could be lots of carbon groups on this side. So a carbonyl, or excuse me, a ketone, is in the middle of a molecule. Could be. Um, it's at least, this one's close to the end. There's a CH3 on the end of the molecule, but it's not right on the end. So ketones could be in the middle, but at very least, they're not right on the end. There's at least a carbon on either side of them. So that distinguishes them from an aldehyde. So they're both have sp2 hybridization. So there's this 120 degree bond angle, right, that we call this trigonal planar, this geometry. Um, and if we take an alcohol and oxidize it, then it turns into a carbonyl group. So depending on what kind of alcohol we're oxidizing, we can make aldehydes and ketones both this way in the lab by oxidizing alcohols. Some other car, uh, carbonyl containing functional groups are carboxylic acids and esters. And again, these are similar to each other in the same kind of way that uh, aldehydes and ketones were similar to each other, which is that they look very similar, except on the aldehyde had an H and the ketone had a C. Well, you can see here the carboxylic acid and the ester, they both have an O that's attached to the carbonyl. Here's the carbonyl in common. And they both have an O, but a carboxylic acid is an OH, and an ester is an OR. So you can see that an ester, here's a carbon-oxygen carbon. An ester kind of looks like an ether, right? And they even kind of sound the same, ester and ether. So it's pretty uh, easy to get those two mixed up. The difference between an ester and an ether is that an ester has a carbonyl group. It has the C double bond O. So yes, it has carbon, oxygen, carbon, but because there's a carbonyl right next to it, or part of it, then that's called an ester instead. That changes the chemistry, so it goes in a different group. Same with this one over here. It says OH. This looks like an alcohol. This looks like an ether. This looks like an alcohol. But the way that this is different than an ether is because of the carbonyl, and the reason this is different than an alcohol is because of the carbonyl. So if there's a carbonyl nearby, a C double bond O, remember carbonyl is C double bond O, if that is part of the functional group, if it's next door to what you think is an alcohol, then that's not an alcohol. If this is next door, it's actually a carboxylic acid. If you think this is an ether, but there's a carbonyl right next door, or it's as part of it, then it's actually an ester. It's not an ether, because that carbonyl changes the group. So it can get tricky when you're looking at a big molecule and you're trying to identify functional groups and you see the OH and you, jump and you automatically jump to say, oh, OH is an alcohol, so I see the OH. You have to also look for the carbonyl. Is it nearby? Now, if the carbonyl was over here, one carbon away, then it wouldn't be a, a carboxylic acid anymore because then the carbonyl would be over here separated from that. This would just be an alcohol in that case. And since the carbonyl would be on this group, 
then that would be an aldehyde. Okay, so let's swap these two groups. I'll show you what I mean. If I have a carbon, carbonyl, CH2, O, H. So what I've done now is I just took these two H's and I moved them over to this carbon. And I took the double bond O and I moved it over to this carbon. I just swapped those two carbons is kind of what I did. So in that case, look what I've done. Now, if I look at these functional groups that I've created on this new molecule, just by moving those groups around, now I would say on this molecule, here's a functional group. And this one is, I can probably call this alkane. Right? And we call this carboxylic acid. But if I move, if I swap those groups and I move that bond over here, now I, I'll circle this one and I'll circle this one. And now this one is called alcohol. Right? Because now it has an OH and there's not a carbonyl right next to the OH, so it's actually just an alcohol. And this one has a carbonyl and an H right next to it, so this is an aldehyde. You see how the position of that carbonyl really changes what the molecule, what groups it is that you're looking at in the molecule. And we could do the same thing over here. If I move this double bond over here, right now I've got a alkane. and an ester. But if I do the same thing and I swap those groups, so now I've got a double bond O on the end, and now this is a CH2 group here in the middle, and that's bonded to O, CH3. So all I did is swap the two groups on this atom and this atom, flipped them, now I would circle this one on the end and call this an aldehyde. It's not an alkane anymore because now it has now it has that carbonyl. And I circle this one on this side and since there's no carbonyl as part of this group, it's just carbon, oxygen, carbon, this is an ether now. So where that carbonyl is affects what functional group you're looking at. Esters are responsible for uh, the fruity smell of fruit and some uh, candy that uh, is purportedly fruit flavored, like uh, grape flavored candy or strawberry flavored candy. It contains an ester that um, is responsible for the smell both in the candy and in the fruit itself. So if you take raspberries and you uh, uh, work, uh, you um, mash them up and you treat them with certain solvents and certain other chemicals and you purify the raspberry, then you can isolate this compound from the mashed up raspberries, isobutyl formate, and this compound by itself is why raspberries smell the way they do, this, this one little molecule. Um, and that's actually not entirely true. There's probably more than one molecule. Uh, there's a, a mixture of molecules that give raspberries their particular smell. But this specific one is, you know, a, a major component of the aroma of, of the raspberry comes from this one molecule. And same with apple is this molecule, and pineapple is this molecule and rum and peach and orange and so on. So you can see in all of these different compounds that have fruity smells, um, the, es the functional group in common is an ester. So you have uh, a carbonyl next to an oxygen and a, next to another carbon. Right? There's, no, there's not an H bonded to this carbon. That would make it a carboxylic acid. There's a carbon bonded to this oxygen, so it's an ester. And same here, there's an ester group, and an ester group, and an ester group, and so on. So all of these have esters. This one has an alcohol hanging on the end, although sometimes when an alcohol is bonded to a 
benzene ring, which is what this one is with a circle, it's not actually an alcohol. We would call that a, a phenol. Here's an epoxide. Here's some aromatic rings. So you can identify the functional groups here, but the, the functional group that is responsible for that fruity smell is the ester. Um, let's move on to amines. Amines are functional groups that contain a nitrogen atom. So here is an example, um, methylamine, and this has two H's and a carbon. So we see here that this one has R3, and R could be a carbon or a hydrogen. So what that means is that this could be H3N, and if there were three H's bonded to an N, we would call that an amine, the simplest amine, and that's called ammonia, NH3, ammonia. If I have one carbon bonded to the N and two H's, there's N always has three bonds, so it could have three H's, or one carbon and two H's, or two carbons and one H, or three carbons and no H's. And all of those are amines. So R is a carbon or a hydrogen. Um, this is methylamine, dimethylamine with two CH3s, trimethylamine, and this molecule down here is called pyridine. And pyridine, you can see, looks like benzene, except instead of having a CH here, that CH has been replaced by an N lone pair, nitrogen lone pair. And so this fits the bill as an amine because R3 and those three R's are carbon. So it's bonded to carbon twice over here. So R1, R2, and then R3, and they're all carbon atoms. So this is an amine. This is an aromatic amine. Pyridine is an aromatic amine. Um, amines appear in um, some plant compounds. So these are called alkaloids, um, nicotine, morphine, codeine, heroin, um, caffeine as well. Um, these alkaloids are compounds that plants create that contain this nitrogen, um, this amine functional group. And generally the purpose of these alkaloid compounds that we find in plants is as poisons for the insects that try to eat them. So uh, caffeine and nicotine, when an insect tries to eat a plant that contains those compounds, you can imagine that if it stimulates our heart to race a little faster, and we're pretty big, then it would stimulate an insect's um, um, nervous system to go into overdrive, and it generally kills them. So these alkaloid compounds are, um, plants generally generate these compounds to protect themselves from would-be uh, creatures that are trying to eat them. Um, of course, as they get, as creatures get bigger and bigger and bigger, those maybe one bite of the plant isn't enough to actually kill that creature anymore, and maybe it, it has a, a, maybe a pleasant effect sometimes, like morphine and codeine. These are our medicines that we use, and uh, heroin, you can see, is pretty similar in structure to these uh, other alkaloids that we use as medicines. Um, and heroin, of course, is a, a drug that people abuse because they think it has a pleasant effect. So um, these compounds that have obviously a lot of carbon and hydrogen and some aromatic rings and some alcohols and ethers and lots of other functional groups, but they all also have this amine. And the amine is critical to the, uh, the psychotropic effects of these compounds. Another place that we find amines is in a biological macromolecule called nucleic acid. So earlier we looked at carbohydrates and saw that carbohydrates had uh, ether functional groups and alcohol functional groups. Um, and carbohydrates are um, sometimes called sugars. Uh, nucleic acids are biological macromolecules. Remember I said there were four of them. This is another group. Uh, and these are uh, groups that contain nitrogen. So these have amine functional groups in them. And of course you can see here's a, a big nucleic acid and we can see amine groups here. Here's an ether group, carbon, oxygen, carbon. Here's an alcohol group, 
So there's lots of other functional groups in a nucleic acid, um, amines included. And nucleic acids, this might look familiar, a nucleic acid is a component of DNA. So um, DNA is the molecule that contains our genetic information. And the DNA monomers, the, the small pieces that make up the really large repeating molecules that we call DNA, those uh, monomers, those small individual pieces, contain nitrogen. And they contain nitrogen in an amine functional group specifically. So these are amines in adenine. And these are, well, here's some amides and an amine in uh, cytosine. And again, some amines. Uh, amine down here, this is an, another amide in guanine. And some amides and an amine in thymine. So uh, these um, nitrogenous bases, components of the nucleic acids, they contain these amine functional groups as well as amide functional groups. So that brings us to the amide, which is a uh, carbon oxygen. It has the carbonyl component, C double bond O. Um, but instead of having carbon on either side, it has a nitrogen on one side. So we've seen that um, when there's a carbonyl that has carbon on both sides, that's called a ketone. A carbonyl with oxygen on one side could be a carboxylic acid or an ester. A carbonyl with nitrogen on one side is called an amide. And so here, this um, notation is to show that just like an amine, this could be NH2, and these could both be H's, or it could be NH1 with a carbon here, or it could be NH0, and both of these could be carbons. So the, it doesn't matter if these atoms are carbon atoms or hydrogen atoms that are stuck to the nitrogen. Either way, we would still call it an amide, because the important part of the amide is the carbon double bond oxygen bonded to the nitrogen. So this part right here is the most important part of the amide. It doesn't really matter what's on this side. It could be a carbon or a, nit or a hydrogen. So here's some um, examples of different am amides. This one, NH2, we can see that both of, the are, uh, both of these groups are hydrogen in this case. And again, over here, both of the groups are hydrogen in this case as well, but they don't have to be. These could be other carbon-containing groups as well. So as well as being um, components of uh, those nitrogenous bases and um, components of DNA, amides, we also see amides in some other kinds of um, synthetic polymers. Um, here's Kevlar. The structure of Kevlar has a an aromatic ring next to a carbonyl, next to an NH, next to an aromatic ring, next to an NH, and then a carbonyl. So they kind of, it goes carbonyl, ring, carbonyl, NH, ring, NH, carbonyl, ring, carbonyl, and so on and so on. This N on the outside of these brackets indicates that this is a repeating pattern and it just goes on and on and on. So um, Kevlar is a synthetic fiber that is sometimes used uh, because of its high tensile strength. So we use Kevlar in um, applications like bulletproof vests. Uh, here is an example of what the, the threads do, what the Kev why the Kevlar has such high tensile strength, is that when there are these long repeating patterns, these threads that go in a row like this, they can um, not only have these strong bonds in between the fibers, so all of these bonds the covalent bonds that make up the fibers are very strong, but also you can see that these bonds that attach the fibers together um, with hydrogen bonds, those are very strong too. So here's the strong amides, repeating amide polymer, and here are the hydrogen bonds that stick those threads together. So um, uh, the hydrogen bonding ability of these amides in a Kevlar vest is similar to what happens in DNA when um, the amides and the amines get next to each other in two, uh, two chains of DNA, they can experience hydrogen bonding like this. And this is similar to what holds the chain, the two chains of uh, a DNA molecule together, the two, uh, the two components of the double helix.
and another um, biological macromolecule. So we've, we've now seen uh, two. We've looked at carbohydrates, which have uh, those alcohols and ethers. We just checked out um, uh, DNA, uh, which a nucleic acid, which has uh, nitrogenous bases, which we saw those amines and the amides, the components of those nitrogenous bases. Uh, and finally, another place that we see uh, amides and amines and carboxylic acids in these biological macromolecules is in proteins. So proteins are molecules, um, again, polymers, similar to uh, uh, DNA, which is a repeating pattern. Those molecules kind of repeat again and again and again in a long chain. Well, uh, proteins are the same way. They kind of repeat again and again and again in a long chain, kind of like Kevlar does. Um, and these polymers um, make up uh, DNA in the case of nucleic acids and nitrogenous bases. And th these repeating chains here make up proteins in the case of amino acids. So this is what an amino acid looks like. An amino acid has a nitrogen containing group here. This is an amine. And it's not an amide because, look, the carbonyl isn't right next to the amine. It's separated by one carbon. So um, instead, we would look at this group and say this is a carboxylic acid, and this is an amine. So an amino acid has an amine and a carboxylic acid, amino acid. So two amino acids can, get, uh, can squeeze together and have a condensation reaction. Because just like we saw before with those two uh, um, ethanol molecules, when we squeeze two ethanol molecules together, we can remove a molecule of water, of H2O, and then the two halves get stuck together. Well, we can do the same thing here with amino acids. If I squeeze these two molecules together, then I can remove a molecule of H2O. See these red atoms here? That's a molecule of H2O. And when I do that, then the N, instead of being bonded to this H, and the C, instead of being bonded to this OH, the N and the C will be bonded to each other. So I can lose that molecule of water and instead create a bond between the carbon and the nitrogen. And that will hook these two amino acids together. So a protein is just a really big molecule that's made of lots of amino acids that get hooked together like this. So one amino acid gets hooked together to another one, which gets hooked together to another one, which gets hooked together to another one. And there might be a hundred amino acids or a thousand amino acids. Proteins are generally um, really huge molecules that have potentially hundreds or thousands of amino acids all stuck together in these really long chains like this. So again, we can see here the amine and the carboxylic acid. Um, between two molecules, I have an amine on one molecule reacting with a carboxylic acid on the other molecule. And what that generates down here is now an amide. So it goes from carboxylic acid plus amine makes amide. Right? Because now the carbonyl is right next to the N. So this makes this an amide. OK, finally, let's look at the different functional groups in a big list again so we can kind of point out their differences one more time um, now that we've, we've looked at them a little bit more closely. So um, obviously, the hydrocarbons are not too difficult. Double bonds, triple bonds, single bonds, aromatic rings, those are fairly easy to distinguish, except maybe the aromatic ring and the alkene are tricky, because sometimes it's an alkene and sometimes it's aromatic. Um, alcohols and ethers are similar, except there's an OH in an alcohol and an OR in an ether, which means that ethers can be in the middle of molecules. But alcohols always hang off the end of a molecule. Um, aldehydes have a carbonyl with an H on the side. Ketones have a carbonyl with an R on the side, which is just another carbon. So you see, um, again, uh, aldehydes hang out on the end of molecules. And ketones can kind of hang out in the middle of the molecule. Carboxylic acids and esters both have O's on either side of the um, 
or on one side of the carbonyl, except a carboxylic acid has an OH, it looks like an alcohol, and an ester has an OR, it looks uh, more like an ether, right? Except, except it has that carbonyl on it. Um, and finally, amines and amides are, compound, are functional groups that contain nitrogen. So a nitrogen without a carbonyl, we call that an amine. And a nitrogen that's next to a carbonyl, we call that an amide.